this is english shorthand dictation number 281 and the dictation speed is 160 words per minute ready start the recent visit of the prime minister of bhutan in west bengal was in itself a significant development in bilateral relations most particularly in terms of the equation within south asian association for regional cooperation if we reflect closely bhutan is one of the very few friends that india has in the neighborhood additionally the visit of the prime minister of bhutan has reinforced the friendly relations between india and bhutan having said that the primary facet of this development was the reopening of all four border gates that bhutan had closed for the past 3 years on account of the corona virus pandemic the resumption of people's movement will now be restored in a bilateral move that is concordant with the fundamental spirit of the south asian association for regional cooperation the grand standing over the reopening of the border gates would suggest that the tiny himalayan nation feels secure about the pandemic ever since march 2020 when corona virus was at its peak bhutan had stopped the movement of people through the land routes the country boasts four transit points which open towards india the prime minister of bhutan was cheered by hundreds of indians who had queued up to enter the kingdom in salubrious weather The local merchants association celebrated this occasion by flying balloons and distributing sweets to people who walked to India from Bhutan. But it is one thing to buttress the camaraderie and quite another to be impervious to illegal influx. The Prime Minister of Bhutan was emphatic on the point that people of both India and Bhutan will have to carry their voter ID cards or passports for registration. Life had virtually come to a standstill in this region during the past 30 months. Let us hope that interpersonal relationships will be revived with this landmark development. The center appears to be closing in on a solution to the Naga issue which emanates from the longest running separatist movement in independent India. The optimism of the central government is based on the likely breakthrough in negotiations with the primary Naga insurgent group NSCN. The NSCN had ceased hostilities after a ceasefire agreement with the government of India well over two decades ago and there have been several rounds of talks between the NSCN and the government since then but there are no tangible results to show that seems all set to change there are two core issues on which negotiations have floundered in the past One is the NSCN's demand for a state constitution for Nagaland and a separate flag for the Nagas. The center's position has been that there is no provision for a state having a separate constitution or flag in the constitution under the aegis of which the Naga issue needs to be resolved. In fact, successive governments have refused to make any such concessions which may lead to similar demands from other states. The current dispensation is at even more of a disadvantage given its firm line on mainstreaming the regions and populations of the Indian Union's periphery as was exhibited in its decision to abrogate articles 370 and 35A that conferred special status on the former state of Jammu and Kashmir but a way out of this impasse may have been found Interlocutors from both sides have apparently agreed that incorporating the salient features of the proposed Naga constitution in the Indian constitution through a bill passed by parliament would do the trick. These features include recognition of a distinct identity, customary laws and autonomy for the Nagas to manage their own affairs. The Home Ministry said that some of these features are already covered by article 371A of the Indian Constitution which pertains to Nagaland additional protection for the cultural social and other customary rights of the Naga people can be incorporated in this article or through a new bill on the separate flag issue the center is believed to be willing to concede the use of the Naga flag in social and cultural functions while the tricolor will fly atop government establishments and at official functions The Greater Nagaland issue is also more or less 
settled. The government has all along maintained that the integration of Naga areas of Assam, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh with Nagaland demanded by the NSCN is a non-starter, though the centre will have no objection if the neighbouring states voluntarily cede their Naga territories to Nagaland. It is well known that Italy is one of the European Union's largest economies. It appears that Italy will turn decisively to the right in its politics. While the exact final results are yet to be determined, all indicators are that a right-wing alliance will win the general elections in Italy with more than 40% of the votes cast. The coalition will likely be led by a new right-wing party known as the Brothers of Italy, led by a controversial politician who has in the past expressed admiration for the country past fascist leader Mussolini. The Brothers of Italy, which received less than 5% of the votes in the last general elections, has surged to dominate the Italian right with an expected falter of the total vote. It has largely replaced its coalition partner, the former Northern League, which was tarnished by association with past unpopular governments. The Northern League will receive far less than 10% of the votes. Italy is not alone. Across Europe, within and outside the European Union, the pressure of an uneven recovery from the pandemic and price rises caused by the Ukraine war have led to a renaissance of the right. In Sweden, the recent elections saw the far-right Sweden Democrats make great gains and achieve influence over the government for the first time in that country's history. In the United Kingdom, a change of guard in the ruling Conservative Party has caused the country's economic management to move sharper to the right than at any point since Margaret Thatcher. Yet the Italian government will have a far greater influence on the future of Europe than the Swedish or the British government. There is a real concern that Italy may adopt an approach that is skeptical of European Union at a time when coordinated action by the European Union is more important than ever. But it will no doubt discover that it is in Italy's interest to not rock the European boat other than rhetorically. The fact is that Italy is by far the largest recipient of common European recovery funds and anything that jeopardizes that flow of cash will make it much harder for the country. The chairman of the Securities and Exchange Board of India has announced that the market regulator is considering extending the concept of ASBA to the secondary market. This announcement has interesting implications. It could smooth out trading for retail investors and enable individuals to earn interest while maintaining market exposure. But it could also result in a massive competitive advantage for banks, which do also offer securities broking services and stand-alone brokers. The ASBA as it stands has proved to be a boon for retail investors in the primary markets. It allows an investor to subscribe to an IPO while placing a lien on the exact funding necessary. In case the investor receives full or partial allotment, the exact amount required is debited and the requisite number of shares transferred. If allotment does not happen in the case of high oversubscription or an incorrect application, the lien is removed. Either way, the money remains in the investor's bank account and continues to generate interest. This is a relatively easy process in the case of an IPO. An IPO is a static process with few entities involved. There is only one security involved, only one agency handling the allotment and only two agencies handling DMAT accounts. Reconciling IPO accounts is not that difficult. Secondary market operations are far more dynamic and involve more stakeholders. When an investor bids to buy a share, that individual is operating through a broker. The bid order is sent to the exchange or to both exchanges in the case of a smart order routing. It is matched against sell orders and if it is executed, the funds and shares are transferred, which means the involvement of the exchange, another exchange and the depositories. It is currently the norm for standalone brokers to ask for funds to be transferred before they execute a trade. While the brokerage account may be interest bearing, it can also be the case that brokers misuse funds and shares which they hold on behalf of clients and delays and defaults do occur. Banks that possess their own trading arms have an advantage in that they can already institute a version of ASBA by tapping directly into the client's bank accounts. The standalone brokers compensate for this in a highly competitive market by charging lower fees and offering more flexibility in terms of margins and more in the way of advisory support. 
if an asba is mandated without thought that existing advantage will tilt more sharply in favor of banks stand alone brokers may also have to invest large sums in creating infrastructure or offer high interest rates on cash deposited with them to support asba while this is a good initiative in theory and will help retail investors the details need to be worked out carefully it can be introduced in a phased manner with feedback from stakeholders